Well, how is everybody tonight? You good? Okay. Are you, uh, are you comfortable? Okay, well, I want you to be. So make yourself at home. I want you to be able to lean back and enjoy yourself. How many of you consider yourselves cooks? Some of you in the room here. Ladies, come on, you better be saying yes. Well, you know how you cook all week long and you cook different meals and finally toward the end of the week, you just take what's left over of all those and put it in a pot and call it stew, right? Okay, well, that's kind of what I've done tonight. I want you to know. I've taken a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, I literally do go all over the country, my wife and I speaking and doing all kinds of things. And I'm also an active pastor. I have been since I was 22, started preaching when I was 16. So what I've done tonight, per Ben and the other guy's suggestion, is I've taken pieces of presentations that I do all over the country that address issues that they want us to think about tonight and they want me to cover. Now, I want you to feel the freedom if you have to get up and move around, if you have to go to the restroom, if you need more coffee or whatever. Uh, if the kids get just a little too bored or a little too restless, I get that. I totally understand that. My wife's like that every Sunday in church, and I just have to tell them, you know, she'll be in and out, but she'll, she'll stick around. She'll be here when it's over. But anyway, feel the freedom to move around, okay? Uh, I am one of you. I am honored to be here, Ben, and I'm just going to refer to Ben, all the rest of the gang. You've got a big group. You've got a great team. Thank you for having me here. You guys have gone to a lot of work. You've advertised. You've, you've done a lot, and I want to thank you for your efforts here. Samuel Adams once said that our job is to start small brush fires of liberty around the country, and our hope is that those brush fires spread and somehow begin to connect and create a raging prairie fire that sweeps across the landscape. Well, that's what we're trying to do, and I'll bet you that's what you're trying to do, and sometimes I feel dwarfed by the whole thing. I mean, when I'm running for governor... Uh, in the primary where I came in fourth, we spent about $341,000. Now, I consider that almost a fortune, right? But the three who finished in front of me, and I'm just talking the primary. I'm not talking about the runoff and then the general. The three who finished ahead of me combined spent over $13 million. Yeah, so it, it's easy to kind of feel dwarfed, you know, to just kind of feel like you're so small that you don't make any difference at all. Well, that is not true. And the devil wants you to feel dwarfed. He wants you to feel like you're insignificant, that you don't make a difference. My friends, we do make a difference. Every one of us has a world that we can affect. It's often been called in theological uh, uh, gatherings concentric circles. Every one of us is at the epicenter of a number of circles. And as we move out on those circles, like ripples in a pond, we affect time and eventually eternity. Every one of us. Now, that's why God has called you. Now, I'm a Christian, obviously. I'm also even worse than that. I'm a pastor, so I'm going I'm to do everything tonight from a biblical worldview. So if I get a little offensive, I don't mean to. I'm not going to be preachy, but I'm just a Christian. And so everything that I do has a biblical base, and um, I, that's, that's how I'll, I'll approach it. So you forgive me if, if I, I, I get a little too on your toes about something that's not my intent at all. What I want to talk about tonight is the fact that liberty is on the edge. I think you know that. I think you get that or you wouldn't be here. Now, it's only 10 days to the election. We can still make a difference. But probably most of the difference has either been made or not made. And regardless of what happens on November the 3rd, the sovereign of the universe remains the same. You remember that. Now, I'm very clear. I'm very bold. I'm not apologetic. I'm a conservative, and I'm a Trump supporter. I want you to know that right now. He is not a perfect person, but the last time I checked, we weren't trying to elect a pastor of the United States. We were trying to elect a president of the United States. And his first term, he's been one of the only guys in my whole lifetime, and I'm 61, that's actually done what he said he was going to try to do when he was running for office. And if he hadn't, to fight, hadn't had to fight people like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, he'd got a lot more done, right? Now, you may not be a big Trump fan. I get that. I was actually a Ted Cruz fan until Ted Cruz didn't make it, and then I became a, a, a Donald Trump fan. But I'll tell you, I'll be honest, I've watched a lot, and I've been in politics myself. I don't know that there's a, there's a human alive that could have taken the political and news media beating that Donald Trump has taken and been able to stand up to it. Uh, he is a man for this moment, and so I am praying for a strong victory 
uh, on uh, Tuesday, November the 3rd. And so I just want you to know that it's not about politics and it's not even about parties anymore. Guys, I'm an equal party offender. I'm just as mad at the Republicans as I am the Democrats. You know why I only served two terms? I was unopposed for my third term. But when I got there, I found out what the problem was. I had suspected it. The problem was Republicans. It wasn't Democrats. And I had bashed my head into the wall for so long that I decided I've got to be able to make a difference in a better way doing something else. I was already doing black robe all over the country and pastoring, and I just felt like I could make a bigger difference doing that rather than spending four and a half, five months of the year uh, at the Capitol just voting yes and no and being pretty much ignored because that's, that's what was going on. So that's the reason I didn't serve three terms. But it was an honor to be there, and I thought it was through politically, and then people came to me and said, Dan, you've got a message that needs to be heard in this gubernatorial race. So, you know, I ran for office, and that's kind of who I am. But I think you know that liberty is on the edge here. Liberty is right on the, the, the precipice. Our republic... I believe, is on the verge of just being broken to pieces. And it's going to take people like us to make the difference. Not about Republican, Democrat. Guys, we've gone way beyond that now. Basically, what we're looking at is light and dark. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at godlessness, everything from a human perspective, and then morality and moral standards and kind of a biblical perspective. Not to say that all Republicans are Christians, because I wouldn't be that silly. I served in the legislature with a bunch of them that I'm not so sure about myself, even though they claim to be Christians. So I want to talk to you tonight about a number of things and how we can make a difference, and history proves that. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, first of all, I, I want to talk to you about some things that I think are very important. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but Hillary has announced she's running again. And so I, I don't know if you, if you, if you knew that, but, but she is. Um, also, uh, we, we need to know uh, that socialist is a person too stupid to know that they're a communist. And so we just, you, you need to know that too. Um, I, I, you know, in being in politics, I've found out what you can do with makeup. This is a before, and then this is an after <laughs> photograph with, uh, with makeup. Um, you know, we hear a lot about weed, and, and don't be confused, uh, or don't confuse the two, because there's weed and then there's dopes, and so you just need to, need, need to keep those straight. And then one last thing that, that I think you need to see, and that is uh, AOC uh, has claimed that she is the new face of the, uh, the Democrat Party. Well, I have found that it looks a lot like the old face, and so I just, um, okay, all right. If I haven't offended you now, you're probably not going to get offended, okay? So we're probably, we're probably okay with each other. Okay, so how do I want to start this? In the spring of 1980, there's a mountain in uh, the state of Washington, you all know it as Mount St. Helens, that had been rumbling and shaking and sending messages, warning people that something cataclysmic was about to happen. And it did. On the morning of May the 18th, 1980, at approximately 8.32, it basically blew half of itself away. This was one of the greatest volcanic eruptions that we've witnessed in modern times and certainly that we've witnessed in North America. This is what Mount St. Helens looked like before and then after the eruption, this is what the mountain looked like after it exploded from the same uh, perspective. Uh, in fact, as it was erupting and sending an ash cloud into the air, that's what that ash, ash cloud looked like 35 miles away. It was 40 miles wide and 15 miles high. Now, there are a lot of people who heeded the warnings and got out of the way, but there were some who did not. One that became pretty famous was a guy named Harry Truman. Harry Truman was told, you need to get out of here. But he said, uh, I'm okay. He uh, was the owner and the operator of his uh, lodge on Spirit Lake. And he said, this area is heavily timbered. Spirit Lake is in between me and the mountain. And the mountain is a mile away. The mountain ain't going to hurt me. Well, today, Harry Truman and his lodge are buried beneath some 150 feet of debris. He did not heed the warnings. To show you the kind of devastation that took place 
when Mount St. Helens erupted, this was a very popular bridge, well known by all the residents in that area, before the eruption. Now, this is what it looked like after the eruption. And those who did not heed the warnings and get out of the way paid the ultimate price. Now, why am I talking about Mount St. Helens? Well, because I believe that we've been experiencing cultural seismic warnings for years. Our culture has been shaking, warning us that something catastrophic quite possibly is about to happen. Well, I don't know if you've been watching news a lot lately, but it is actually happening. Now, we all believe that all lives matter. Doesn't matter how much melanin you have in your skin, whether you're dark or you're light like me or somewhere in between. But Black Lives Matter, Inc., the actual movement, I've discovered is not anything about black lives or white lives or any other lives. They're actually a Marxist group. Two of their co-founders admit to being trained Marxist organizers. So what's happening in our culture today, I believe, are seismic warnings warning us that something's up. Something is happening to the very heart and soul of our culture. People who are practicing lawlessness and breaking into stores and taking whatever they want, looting without any re real repercussions and flaunting their lawlessness right in our faces warns us that something is terribly wrong in our culture, right? Yeah, something is terribly wrong as people can do this in broad daylight. Things that when I was a kid, you wouldn't have dared thought about doing. And yet this is happening in cities all over the U.S. And guys, it's not any one racial group involved. In fact, I've noticed in most of the writing, it seems to be Caucasians like me who are per, uh, perpetrating a lot of the, the, the crime and the lawlessness. Well, I believe that all of these are simply signals that something is wrong, that something is very sick in our culture. And if we don't do something about it, my friends, it's going to come to every one of our states, to every one of our towns. None of us are going to be immune. Every one of us will have to ultimately face what's going on in our culture. So who's next? Well, we all are if we don't start to do what we know we ought to do. Now, that's difficult talk. I know that. None of us want to talk about being engaged and being all that active. Most of us live our lives and we try to do the very best for our families. But over the years, I've watched and something has happened to our culture. And you really see it in the millennial generation showing up more than in any of the previous, although the problem was there in the previous generations as well. And that is, we do not have a proper world view. Now, for those of us who are Christian, we know that we need to see the world through a biblical lens. All of us have a world view. Every one of us see the world through some lens. It's either primarily a humanist lens or it's a biblical lens. We either believe in moral standards established by a moral law giver, ultimately the one who made everything, or man is the measure of all things. But every one of us has some kind of worldview. Now, a while ago we were hearing that we are salt and light and how we are citizens of heaven. Yeah, but you have dual citizenship because you're also a citizen of here. God has left us here for a reason. So you're one who carries dual citizenship. Yeah, you're going to heaven someday. And unfortunately, most Christians only want to focus on that. But we also have a responsibility, as was said a while ago, to be salt and light while we are here. Now, you know what salt does. It retards decay, right? And light reduces darkness. Well, what happens if you take the salt away, well, decay runs away, right? Runs away with the entire world. What happens when you take light away? Darkness overwhelms us. So ultimately, every one of us is called by the Lord to be salt and light. You're very familiar with these passages of Scripture where Jesus tells us that we are salt and we are light. 
He even warns us if we don't do our job and lose our saltiness, what are we worth but to be walked on? Peter reminds us that we are supposed to shine as lights in a dark and crooked and perverse generation. Every one of us has a biblical spiritual responsibility to be salt and light in our area of influence. And you have an area of influence. I promise you, you are in that epicenter of a number of circles where you can make a difference. The question is, will you do it? Now, for most people, and I've been a pastor all of my life in America, we have developed a really bad philosophy. You'll hear it called separation of church and state. You'll hear it called political correctness. Well, all of those are a part of this problem. Now, what you're looking at there, obviously, is a styrofoam plate. Ones that we either use when all the family are over or we go out to the lake or we go camping or whatever. We use these uh, divided plates. And every one of us, if we're not careful, are going to become victim of what I call compartmentalization. We live in a world where people kind of compartmentalize their lives. I encounter a lot of Christians who say, well, you know, I have a secular life. I've got a work and a career, so there's the part of my life there. But then there's a little wall, and we don't let what's in these other compartments mix or spill over into one another. And, and so I also have, I'm trying to get this thing to cooperate with me, and I am having tons of problems. I have a home life, I have a religious life, I have a political life. And it's almost as if we think that those are all different compartments. And we don't let any one of them spill into the other. And yet the Bible tells us that we are to do all things as unto the Lord. That everything we do is supposed to be done with Christian conviction. There's no such thing as a secular part of your life and a spiritual part of your life. Everything you do if you're a believer is spiritual. In fact, I would even argue if you aren't a believer, still everything you do is spiritual. Everything we are, everything we do has a spiritual dimension to it. And yet we live in a day when in the church world, in the Christian world, we have people who say, well, I can't get political here. So I have to keep that part of my life separate from my work and my career. And I have to keep that part separate from my life. And yet the Bible says we do everything. So this is why I, as a full-time pastor, ran for the legislature and served and continued to serve in my church, which is a very large church of about a thousand people in Yukon, Oklahoma. You can do both. You can chew and walk, chew gum and walk at the same time. And so I was serving because I believe that I needed to take the salt and the life that God had put into me into the halls of government. And I would argue that if more people who really get this would do that, we would have a different kind of government. Now, over the years, I've had people tell me, well, but Dan, you know, I can't stand up against my government. Why, Paul says in Romans 13 that we're to offer unlimited submission to the government. We Christians can't stand up and rebel. Why, if we do, we're sinning. I've actually heard that taught and preached for years. In fact, you know who one of the, the main proponents of that idea has been over the last 20, 30, 40 years? A pastor out in Southern California named John MacArthur. A pastor who I, re I respect greatly. But with what Governor Newsom is doing in California, becoming the tyrant that he is, and has told churches, you can't meet. Churches are being fined. There's one church in particular, a Baptist church in Southern California, that has already been fined $100,000 for having church services. John MacArthur has been threatened with jail time. Now all of a sudden, John has changed, and he's taken it to the governor. He said, look, I am called by God, and we're going to meet whether you want us to or not, because my job is to obey God, not you. So having heard this idea that Christians are not supposed to stand up against authority, I actually wrote a book, and, and I, uh, I brought copies somewhere. I don't, know, I don't know what exactly I did. Oh, here they are. I just released this book where I do a historical, biblical, exegetical look at Romans 13, and actually Paul was not saying 
that we have to offer unlimited submission to government. Proper government is one that we need to submit to. So when we think about the idea that we, uh, we can't stand up to those in authority because the Bible tells us that we have to submit, that's just a way to keep us silent, guys. That is just a way that they've kept the church out of their little playground so that we don't affect it. So does the Bible really teach this? Well, the, the truth is actually no. I mean, think of biblical examples. The Hebrew midwives were told by Pharaoh, you got to kill all these Jewish baby boys. But they refuse to do so. And God rewards them for disobeying. You can go through scripture and there are many, many examples. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do because this is really slowing me down. So I'm going to try this thing on the chart. I'm going to see how far away from this I can get. Because I want to pull this thing up here. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Let me see if I can get this thing Because this clicker, for some reason, is not working very fast and so it's chewing up a lot of my time because I'm trying to get it to click and it won't go I apologize for that sometimes things just don't work the way you want them to right so we make changes all right so he's talking about the Hebrew midwives God honored them Moses refuses to submit to Pharaoh Queen Esther approaches the king against the law because she was uninvited Shadrach Meshach and Abednego I call them the three asbestos boys they wouldn't bend they wouldn't bow they wouldn't burn uh, they refuse. Uh, Daniel, he was told, look, there's a 30-day moratorium on prayer. Just 30 days. Does that sound familiar? Just 30 days. Stay in your houses, right? Just 30 days you can't pray. Daniel defies the king. God honors him for it. Jesus refuses to abide by some of the, um, the Sabbath laws that the Jews had written that were a twisting of Scripture. The apostles and early Christians refused to stop preaching. Believers through the ages have defied tyrants. I mean, think about the ones that we call the pilgrims, the separatists. They were, they were defying English law to do what they did. This is a picture of them hangs in our national uh, capital rotunda. Here they are on the speed well. And when they got to the New World, they wrote the Mayflower Compact and listened to their purpose that they said for coming. Having undertaken for what? The glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. What does that make the pilgrims? Doesn't it make them missionaries? The separatists, they weren't Puritan, by the way, they were separatists. The separatists that we call pilgrims tell us they were missionaries. Over and over and over, we find Christians through history that stood up against tyrants. What about the uh, Lexington Minutemen, the 77 or some of them, who stood up to the British Redcoats at a place called Lexington, Massachusetts, and then later on that afternoon in Concord? Most of them led by a preacher. Did you know that when Paul Revere makes his famous ride on April the 18th, he rides to the pastor's house in Lexington named Jonas Clark? Jonas Clark pastored the church that John Hancock's grandfather had pastored years before, the famous John Hancock. Well, Jonas Clark, with the help of a deacon named John Parker, had been training the men of Lexington to fight together as soldiers. They were called Minutemen. Who forgot to tell you that the famous Lexington Minutemen were trained by a preacher and a deacon? When they went out to face the British Redcoats the next morning on April the 19th, 1775, Paul Revere had ridden to the preacher's house that had a kind of a council of war, and they make a stand in the churchyard led by their preacher and their deacon. You see, there's a lot of our history that we've uh, had withheld from us. When our framers, I call them the framers because they framed our form of government, when they said no to the British and wrote the Declaration of Independence, do you realize that that was a document of separation and secession? And yet we celebrate that document. When the terrible scourge of slavery was allowed in our land, states like Wisconsin said no. And they refused to abide by the Fugitive Slave Act. And they said if a slave makes it to Wisconsin, they're on free ground. Corey Ten Boom lived in Germany in the 1930s. She wasn't even Jewish. She was Dutch. She and her entire family, except for her, were killed by the Nazis because they were helping Jews to escape to safety. She was disobeying the government of her day. What about this Lutheran preacher named Dietrich Bonhoeffer? He was so committed that Hitler was evil, he actually participated in attempts to assassinate Hitler. They captured him, and he was hanged with a piano string two weeks before the Allies liberated the concentration camp where he was held captive. He's a Lutheran preacher. How many of you have seen Schindler's List? 
This is Oscar Schindler. He saves over 1,200 Jews by defying the authorities of his day. What about Martin Luther King and, and the uh, uh, movement that he led against all of the Jim Crow laws and all the segregation and all of the unfair, uh, unequal laws of his day? He was defying authority. So this whole idea, and of course we celebrate all these people, so the whole idea that we're supposed to knuckle under because these people are in authority, and Paul said in Romans 13, you have to do so, guys, is simply not biblical. And yet most Christians have been frozen in their tracks and won't engage because they're so afraid that they're going to be sinning. And so we stand by when things like this are happening. When we're taking little pre-born babies, and of course, unfortunately, now in the state of Virginia, you can have a baby that's born by a botched abortion and it's still alive, and they, the governor said, well, we'll put it on a table and cover it up and keep it, keep it comfortable until the mother and the physician decide what to do. What do you mean, what to do? Of course, he's referring to whether or not they're going to kill it. And so, we're told, well, it's just a blob of tissue well, there's a 3D ultrasound of a 17-week-old baby. Does that look like a blob of tissue to you? Yeah, a blob of tissue that's called a human. Here's a 20-week 3D ultrasound. Does that look like a blob of cells or a blob of undiscernible tissue? No, of course not. You say, well, we're in Oklahoma, and we know that we've been killing babies now uh, legally since 1973, so we've knocked off about 62 million of them, but we don't do it that much in Oklahoma. No, we only kill about 15 or 20 every week. In Oklahoma, since 1973, we've murdered over 200,000 babies in Oklahoma, one of the reddest of the red states. And guys, whether we want to be or not, in some way or another, we're accomplices to the crime. Because we'll elect these people that go down there to the legislature who told us on their doorstep that they were pro-life. But guys, I was there. I was in the closed door meetings. I saw what goes on behind the curtain. And let me tell you, those pro-life people that we send over there behind the curtain when the doors are closed will kill any effort that would actually end abortion. All these pro-lifers, all these Christian pro-lifers that you send over there, most of them won't touch this with a 10-foot pole. And we are slaughtering these little children. And you're telling me that we're supposed to submit to that? This is one of the reasons why I made that such a primary plank in my gubernatorial campaign. I don't have time to go into all this, but Paul tells us the kind of government that we're supposed to submit to. A government that punishes evildoers and rewards doers of good. But what happens when a government stops doing that? and starts allowing or even promoting. I mean, Biden and Harris have said they are for abortion. And not only are they for it, they will fight to preserve it and if possible, expand it. That one thing alone should determine for everyone who you're going to vote for. That one issue alone. And yet Christians today are so afraid. And this whole idea that we have to submit and cooperate with everyone, well, Paul says that's not always possible. He says if it's possible, as much as would depend on you, live peaceably with all men. But guys, sometimes it is not possible. This is why during the period that we call the War of Independence in the 18th century, there were many preachers who said no Tomorrow morning at the Cowboy Church in Yukon, I'm going to be doing a presentation in period costume where I become some of these men and I tell their story. Now, I don't have time tonight to go into all of it, but there were great preachers like Jonathan Mayhew who preached sermons like this. Common tyrants and public oppressors are not entitled to obedience from their subjects by virtue of anything here laid down by the inspired apostle. He's talking about Paul writing Romans 13. For a nation thus abused to arise unanimously and resist their prince even to the dethroning him is not criminal but a reasonable way of vindicating their liberties and just rights. It is making use of the means and the only means which God has put into their power for mutual and self-defense and it would be highly criminal in them not to make use of this means. It would be stupid tameness and unaccountable folly for whole nations to suffer one unreasonable, ambitious and cruel man to wanton and riot in their misery. 
You know who this guy was? He's one of the most famous preachers of the first great awakening in America, Jonathan Mayhew. And yet most Christians have never even heard of him. We're never taught about these preachers in history class in school because separation of church and state. Now we can t be taught all day long about Marxists. We can know how many hairs were in you know, Lenin's head. But we can't talk about the preachers in our history. And, and over and over and over, and I'm not going to have time to go through all of this because I told you I just threw a stew together and some of this we'll just skip over. But listen to just a little portion of this guy's sermon. This is Joseph Lathrop. As you can see, he was a pastor in Massachusetts. He preached this in 1787. Listen to what he said. Perhaps it will be asked, is there no case in which a people may resist government? Yes, there is one such case. And that is when rulers usurp a power oppressive to the people and continue to support it by military force in contempt of every respectful remonstrance. That means when the people have cried out and the government leaders ignore them. Friends, it is time for the American church to wake up. Now, a lot of people say, well, we don't, we don't want to be rebels. Well, here's Samuel Cooper. I actually have an election sermon out there on the table in the museum that he preached in 1759 during the French and Indian War. He pastored the Brattle Street Church in Boston. To show you what kind of influence he had, his church was called the Church of the Patriots. Guys like John Adams and Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Adams attended his church. He was pen pals, what we'd call pen pals with Benjamin Franklin when he was in Europe. I want you to listen to what Samuel Cooper said. We are not exciting rebellion, opposition, nay, open avowed resistance by arms against usurpation and lawless violence. It is not rebellion by the law of God or the land. Resistance to lawful authority makes rebellion. That's not what we're doing. And I could go on and give you example after example. Many of you probably have never seen this. Did you know that Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams were given the task in 1776 of designing our national seal? Now, it was presented to Congress on August the 20th, 1776, and unfortunately, it was rejected. Do you know what Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams believed ought to be our national seal? That. Notice what it says around the perimeter. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. In the center of it is the Egyptian army being drowned in the Red Sea. If you look to the left, that's Moses and the Israelites... And over them is the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud that led the Israelites. Now think about it. We're told that Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were ungodly deists and were the least spiritual of all the founders. Well, they both, along with John Adams, thought this ought to be our national seal. I wish they had prevailed. What a national seal that would be. That's what they presented in 1776. Friends, I'm telling you, we've been lied to. We've been lied to about our history. This is a, a historian in Duke University. Her name was Alice Baldwin. She's written an incredible book about the, the preachers of the uh, revolution. She said, probably the most fundamental principle of the American constitutional system is the principle that no one is bound to obey an unconst unconstitutional act. No single idea was more fully stressed, no principle more often repeated, through the first 60 years of the 18th century than that governments must obey law and that he who resisted one in authority who was violating that law was not himself a rebel but a protector of the law. And yet how often are you told, well, the Supreme Court said it, so it's the law of the land. We can't do anything about it. If you had said anything to this generation, they'd have said, you're nuts. What about the Dred Scott decision? where Taney and the rest of the justices said that black people are not people, they're property. Had we been alive then, we would have just said, oh, well, that's what the Supreme Court said, so I guess it's so. I mean, today we abhor that, right? And we say, how in the world could people have thought like that? But they just knuckled under. And now the Supreme Court says, well, it's okay to murder these babies. And we just say, oh, well, what can I do? I'll tell you what you can do. You can start speaking out. You can start telling people that abortion is not just getting rid of a blob of tissue. It's murder. Call it what it is. It is murder. There's just no crime tape and no chalk shape of a body on a sidewalk, but that's what it is. So the preachers of this period of time, and I, and I wish I had time to go into all these guys. Uh, this, is, this is Peter Muhlenberg. Peter Muhlenberg was a Lutheran who pastored in Woodstock, Virginia, he became a member of George Washington's 
uh, commanding staff. He preached in front of his church with his preaching robe on, and at the end of his sermon, he pulled off his robe and revealed his colonel's uniform that he's wearing there, and he began to recruit the men from his church and his community, and they joined the 8th Virginia Regiment, and he led them from 1776 to 1783. By the time the war was over, this Lutheran preacher was promoted to Major General Peter Muhlenberg. His statue, that's a picture of it right there, stands in Statuary Hall in our national capital in Washington, D.C. today. I've led tours there, stood right beside his statue. This is a Lutheran preacher, Peter Muhlenberg. And I could give you story after story. This is John Witherspoon. You know who John Witherspoon is? He's a Presbyterian preacher who was a member of the Continental Congress that wrote and voted for the Declaration of Independence. He was also the president of what became Princeton University. He signed the Declaration of Independence? Yes. Here's a Presbyterian preacher by the name of Reverend James Caldwell. This is a, uh, a preacher by the name of Naphtali Daggett who was the president of Yale who when the British invaded uh, New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale is, he and about 100 boys from the school rode out and fired a few shots at the British to slow them down so the citizens could get out of town. They captured Daggett and beat him so brutally he never recovered and died a few months later. The president of Yale. This is uh, uh, Thomas Allen, another preacher. He's from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I mean, I could just tell you a story. I don't, I don't have time to go into this tonight. But my point is, we have a history of the church standing up and saying, no. And yet the church today is hiding behind Romans 13 and hiding behind cowardly pastors who won't touch anything that even sounds political. Now think about this. If you ask most people that have any knowledge of our country or of Scripture, and you ask them, what are the three institutions that God created so that we could have a civil society? If I were to ask you that, could you answer that question? What are the three institutions that God created in Scripture where we could have a civil society? What are they? The home, the state, and the church. Those are all three established in Scripture by God. So it is as equally spiritual to preach on any one of those three as it is to preach on the other two. But today we believe that you can only preach on the home and the church and we don't preach about government. And yet the Bible's filled with it. I challenge you, go home and look through your Old Testaments and see how many Old Testament heroes you can find that were not involved in government at some level. You almost can't find any. Why? Because God wants us to be salt and light. So when our framers wrote the Declaration and then they met together and wrote the Constitution based upon the Declaration of Independence, they understood certain principles that we have not been taught and we have forgotten. Thomas Jefferson, right there in the Declaration of Independence, tells us that when a government ceases to do what it's supposed to do, and I don't have time to go back and look, but he says the primary purpose of government is to protect your rights given to you not by government, but God. So God gives rights to us and we form governments who are supposed to protect our rights that we get from God. That's their job. What happens when a government doesn't? What are we supposed to do? Listen to what Thomas Jeff He gives three levels of response. He says, when any government, any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, what? Protecting your rights. It is the right Later on, he says, the duty of the people. Who's the people? Those, those folks that we elect in the Congress or the legislature? No, us. To do what? Three levels. Here we go. Alter. That's DEFCON 3. That means to kind of fix it because we've gotten off track. Or to abolish it. That's DEFCON 2. It's gotten so off track that we can't fix it, so we just got to wipe the slate clean and start over. In fact, I've had a lot of people ask me, Dan, what do you think the founders would say today? And I think one of the things they'd be surprised of is that we haven't already wiped the slate clean and started over. I think they'd be amazed that we haven't done that. What's the third response? DEFCON 1. That's when we've let it go so long that our government has become a tyranny. And what does he say that you do? Well, later on the document, he says you throw it off. By the way, that was where they were when he wrote that. They were at DEFCON 1. And you say, well, Dan, you're, you're talking here about revolution and fighting. Oh, no, I don't have any desire in that. The last thing in the world I want to do is see us have a shooting war. 
But I'm telling you, friends, we are irreconcilably divided today in America. And there are those who are far left and those who are right. And we're so divided that I don't see any way that we can reconcile what we believe. We better figure out how to coexist together or we are probably going to be shooting at each other. And so we've got to become students of these kind of things, and we've got to learn what we're supposed to do. So how do we do this? Well, when I was running for governor, one of the things that I was emphasizing was the, the authority of the state. Now, I don't have time tonight to do an entire presentation on state sovereignty. I do that. I travel around and actually just do one presentation for about 45 minutes on state sovereignty. What did the framers intend? Most people believe today that the federal government allows states to exist so that the states can carry out what the federal government wants. You realize it's the exact opposite? The states formed the federal government, not the other way around. So when the states, originally 13 of them, delegated, they didn't surrender, they delegated, that means to loan. They delegated certain powers to this new government that they were forming, they were really afraid. They were afraid that that government would start overreaching and run over their liberties. Did you know that when the Constitution was first written and sent out to the states, it was going to fail? It was going to fail. So James Madison, who was the primary author of the Constitution, sat down and he wrote what were originally 12 amendments. They sent them out to the states and 10 were adopted. What are those 10 called today? Bill of Rights, right? Do you know what the Bill of Rights actually do? They list the negative powers of government. You need to remember that. The negative powers of government. What does that mean? The, the first ten amendments tell the government what they can't do. See, the Constitution says what they can do. And the citizens said, we don't want to know what the government can do. We want to tell them what they can't do. See, in the, in the beginning... When our country was formed, citizens were far more concerned about what government could do to them than what government could do for them. They knew it was a necessary evil. They had to have it because we live in a fallen world. So they wanted to limit. So they'll go down through starting with the First Amendment. Congress can't make any law about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, all that. Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms for defense shall not be infringed. Do you, did you know that right now, in the Democrat strategy, if they win, that they want to create a $200 per year tax on any firearm you own that they deem as an assault weapon? Now, right now, they claim that's an AR-15. Of course, if you're Biden, it's an AR-14. You know, you don't, or, you know, AR-15. But you realize that by their definition of an assault weapon, you're 45... Glock or your 45 Colt could actually be deemed an assault weapon because every time you pull the trigger, it fires. They're going to they're gonna tax you every year $200 per assault weapon. What part of shall not be infringed do they not get? So they got down to the 9th and 10th Amendments, and they said, let me tell you what we want to say here, especially the 10th Amendment that we're more familiar with, you can't do all these things, amendments 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And in case we forgot anything, you can't do that one either. And that's what the Tenth Amendment says. The Tenth Amendment basically says that ultimately all the powers not specifically stated in this Constitution, there are 18 of them, it's called the Enumerated Powers, Article 1, Section 8. All those powers are all that the federal government has, and if they use one more power, the states are to step in. Listen to James Madison. The powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. How many of you think the federal government today believes their powers are few and defined? He says, those which remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. Do you get the idea of what he meant? And then he says... Here's what the federal government will be over. External objects like war, peace, negotiation, foreign commerce. Well, what would the states be in charge of? All the objects which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the lives, liberties, properties of the people and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. 
So where did they get the right to tell you you have to buy health insurance? Is that a power that they have? No, they took it. So we citizens don't know this stuff. See, most of us, it was so long ago when we talked civics, and most of us who were in a civics class didn't care about it, and the civics teacher didn't care about it, and they weren't any good at it anyway. And so we just tried to, to wade through it and get a C and get out of there. And we don't really know how our government functions. And we've been sitting on our rear ends now for about five or six decades, and now we're one election away on Tuesday, November the 3rd, of turning this thing over to AOC and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Kamala Harris. You realize that Biden is just a placeholder? That guy will not be, if he wins, he won't be president six months. Nancy Pelosi is already trying to prepare to invoke the 25th Amendment. You know why she's doing that? It isn't for Trump. It's for Biden. Because they want Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris has a voting record left of Bernie Sanders. I don't know if you know that. She actually votes more Marxist than Bernie Sanders, who is an avowed Marxist. She couldn't even win her primary. She was the first one to drop out in the Democratic primary. So they stick her in as VP knowing that Biden, if he wins, can't make it. And she automatically then becomes president. And they put a full-blown, full-throated Marxist in as president of the United States. And we're stuck. That's how close we are, friends. Now, I'm not here to scare you. I'm just here to tell you. Jefferson, of course, repeats what uh, Madison had said. Listen to this, what Jefferson says. To take a single step beyond the boundaries thus specifically drawn around the powers of Congress is to take possession of a boundless field of power no longer susceptible of any definition. That's what we have today. He's actually predicting what we have. Now, I'm going to skip through some of this. So... When the, when the federal government starts taking powers that it doesn't have, what does Madison, the author of the Constitution, say we should do? He says, the states, who are parties thereto, have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil. We have the sheriff here tonight. Did you know that he is the highest ranking law officer in this county? He outranks federal officers. As sheriff, he can ask federal officers to leave this county. You know what his job really is? His job as sheriff really is to interpose between you and bad guys, be they criminals or elected to Congress. That's his job, to interpose for you. That's why he is sheriff. He's elected by you. He's not appointed. He doesn't get the promotion and become sheriff. He's elected by you. Thank you for being here, sir, and thank you for doing what you're doing and for being where you are. But see, we don't get this. We don't know all of this stuff. We weren't taught it. Listen to what Jefferson says here. If the federal government assumes undelegated powers, their acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. What is he saying there? Ignore them! This is Thomas Jefferson. By the way, he's the author of the Declaration of Independence. Notice I'm quoting from the author of the Constitution and the author of the Declaration. I figure these guys knew what they were writing. And he says, look, if they step outside. So what should we do in Oklahoma with abortion? Is there a constitutional right of the federal government to force us to allow preborn babies to be murdered in our state? Can you find that anywhere in the Constitution? Of course not. That's one of the things that I was going to do if I got elected governor. I was going to hold a constitutional convention, and I mean constitutional for the Constitution of the state of Oklahoma. We're going to fix it because our state constitution is a mess. Fix it and then stand on that state constitution and tell the federal government no more babies murdered in Oklahoma. You say you can do that? Sure, Governor Stitt could start that process tomorrow. Do you know what President Trump has said in private when he was asked if a state did that, would he support them? He said, yes. Yes. You see, one of the reasons we keep losing the fight is because we're not in it. This is what the founders originally intended. There's the federal government. There's the state government. This is what we have now. Federal government, state government. That's what we have now. That's why you need to understand what state sovereignty is. That's why you need to understand the authority 
that our states have. Now, I'm running out of time here, and I know it. Uh, I'm going to bypass Samuel West's sermon, even though you really need to hear it. But I don't have time for it, and I want to go to right here. Some of you recognize this gentleman, and some of you do not. But for those of you who do not, that's Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams was the leader of the Sons of Liberty. We actually have a collection outside of one of the Sons of Liberty who was close friends with Samuel Adams, who helped get the ball rolling for our separation from Great Britain and then the war to secure it. I want you to listen to what Samuel Adams said many years ago. If ever a time should come when vain and aspiring men possess the highest seats in government, our country will stand in need of its experienced patriots to prevent its ruin. Do you know who he's talking to? All of us in this room. That's who he's talking to. This is why it is so important for groups like this to be formed. This is why it is so important that we get off of our church pews and into the fight. See, most of us think we've done God a big favor if we go to church tomorrow. As if God needs us there. I mean, we need to be there. I'm a pastor. You know, I tell my people they're going to burn in hell if they skip church. So, you know, I just, I just want them to know. Most of them don't know their Bibles very well, but they do know about hell. And they don't want to go there, so they trust me, so they'll come. But do you realize that's not really where the fight is? Have you ever watched, um, like, Band of Brothers or any of the his, uh, history series or movies about World War II where they're getting ready to invade Normandy, France? You remember they had all these training times, and they'd memorize all these maps and all that, and they'd meet together, and they'd learn how to read the compass and all that kind of stuff? See, that was preparation for the invasion, right? But eventually, on a day that we call D-Day in 1944, they actually invaded and they used the strategy that they'd been talking about. What if they'd only had the strategy sessions and they'd never invaded? What good would those strategy sessions have been? We meet together every time in our churches on Sundays and Wednesdays and we strategize. But we never invade. For us, that's the fight. I went to church today. Fought the good fight. And then we hang everything up, and then next Sunday, we go back, and there's the fight. No, friends, that's the training session. The fight is out there. But most Christians are huddled in their churches fighting each other. Come on. I've been a pastor for years in a Baptist church. Buddy, we know how to fight. I'm telling you, we Baptists can fight. The problem is we don't ever fight the right foe. We fight each other. But if we get one of our members of our army wounded, we just shoot them. We don't mess with it. So liberty is on the edge here. Now, here's what I want to do in the last four minutes. Is we got a little bit of a late start, so I apologize. But it's just a touch after 7, so we're still pretty good. I want to share with you, and Ben, you're just going to have to help me because I had to move all this. So... Uh, let's start with the Bunker Hill gun. Let's start with that. We brought this museum with us tonight because I believe that you need to see and touch your history. For me, it's just really cool to stand here and hold this, this musket. This was owned by a man named Lieutenant William Perkins. He was a militia lieutenant, not a regular military. This is called a Fowler. You can see how the, the stock sways down. It's a 78 caliber. He carried this and used it at the Battle of Bunker Hill. See, there was a time when Americans would fight for what they believed in. Now, please understand, I don't want us to have to come to that point. I don't want DEFCON 1. But see, friends, we've blown right through DEFCON 3. And we're now looking at DEFCON 2 and staring down the barrel of DEFCON 1. Okay, so tonight, I'm going to be out there at the table. I want you to hold that one. Okay, here's the next one. That's a perfect order. This musket is a French musket in the shipment of 15,000. It's the first shipment that Benjamin Franklin bought from France. They were sent over here to America. These were delivered three months before the Battle of Lexington and Concord. 
They were given out to the militias. A militia soldier by the name of Isaac Cook owned this one. His name is stamped right here, and on the back side he's carved his initials, I.C. He carried this musket across the Delaware River with George Washington and used it at the Battle of Trenton, New Jersey. It was snowing and sleeting that night because it was Christmas. And about a third of the soldiers didn't have shoes. And he said they were leaving bloody footprints in the snow. And we think we really have it hard if we climb into an air-conditioned or a perfectly heated automobile and drive four or five blocks to church. These guys are marching in snow in almost zero weather with sleet hitting them in the face. He talks about it in some of the writings that he has leaving bloody footprints in the snow where their feet were cracking from the cold, crossing the Delaware River as ice chunks are floating down it so they could fight the Hessians the next morning in Trenton, New Jersey. You need to hold this. Because Isaac Cook carried it in the snow. This musket was used by a man named Adam Miller on August the 6th, 1777. Adam Miller fought at the Battle of Oriskany, New York. Most of us have never heard about the Battle of Oriskany. It's probably the bloodiest battle, maybe, of the entire War of Independence. The reason being is the Indian tribes had allied with the British, and the Americans are fighting the Indians and the British, and those Indians are fighting guerrilla warfare style. So it's just a bloody melee. Adam Miller had been captured and what they were doing, the British were taking all the, the, the prisoners and turning, over to the, turning them over to the Indians, and the Indians were torturing them to death. So Adam Miller was being marched to his death when one of his commanders saw what was going on and pulled out his flintlock pistol and shot the British officer leading these prisoners off to be tortured to death. Well, Miller broke free and ran off and picked up this very musket. This musket's actually in a book on the history of flintlock muskets of the war. And he started fighting again. He saw that his captain had been captured and the Indians had pinned his captain to the ground by driving, wait just a second, by driving a bayonet through each thigh. He was nailed to the ground. They were going to torture him to death. Adam Miller takes this musket, runs into the middle of those braves and start hitting them with the stock, with the butt end of this stock. He freed his commander, dragged him to safety, and continued to fight using this musket. When the battle was over, probably somewhere under a shade tree, because it's August, he carves right here in the stock, and every time I put my hand on it, it just almost sends cold chills through me. A. Miller, he writes Oriskany phonetically like the Indians did. It's not how you actually spell it, but Oriskany, 1777. It was a time when Americans would stand up for what they believe in. One last musket. It's pro- Thank you, Ben. It's probably our rarest and most history-filled flintlock. And what I'm holding here is a musket made by a gunsmith in Concord, Massachusetts. His name was Samuel Barrett. Are you familiar with the 50 caliber Barrett? Samuel Barrett. He was the nephew of Colonel James Barrett. Colonel James Barrett was the militia commander who lived on a hill today called Barrett Hill. If you go to Concord, you'll see that there's a museum made out of Colonel Barrett's house. It's set on a hill overlooking the Old North Bridge. Are you familiar with what happened at the Old North Bridge? That's where the Continental Militia fought the Redcoats at the Battle of Concord. That's where the the, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson... uh, wrote the the poem, Conquered Him, The Shot Heard Round the World, right there. This was made by a deacon in the church in Concord named Samuel Barrett, connected to Colonel James Barrett. But it was carried by a soldier who was a cabinet maker by the name of Jeremiah Kimball, who sometime, I guess, during the war did all this scroll work in the stock. He carved his name, some of the places that he fought, like Rhode Island. He was actually from New Hampshire, and so it says... NHM right here, New Hampshire Militia. On this side, which is the brass plate opposite the lock, he carved into it Ticonderoga, 1776. Hmm. 
when you hold things like this, it's like somehow the courage and the boldness and the patriotism is almost supernaturally transferred to you. Now, not literally. But we Americans need to get back in touch with our history. We Americans need to quit hiding behind our Christianity and stop apologizing for what we believe and start telling people at the water cooler, you're wrong, and if we go that direction, we're going to become a Marxist country. We Americans need to hook up and start doing something. Some of you need to run for office. Some of you need to run for city council, mayor, school board. Through the stupid COVID nonsense, we've seen how powerful mayors and city councils can be. They can become little dictators. We need to get those people off and get liberty lovers on. So, Ben, we've kind of used up probably our time because we got started a little bit late. You're, you're the master of this thing. How do you want to do it before we kind of wrap it up and, and I ask uh, Brother Schuyler to come up and close us? You want to do a little bit of Q&A real quick? Okay, but well, we don't want to wear you all out, but I would be happy to entertain a few questions if you have them. I know that this has just kind of been coming from everywhere, but these were some topics that Ben and his guys really wanted me to cover tonight. And it's kind of like drinking out of a, a fire hydrant, I know, but there's ways to back up now and learn this stuff piece, piece by piece. What I'm telling you is, guys, it's way past midnight, not literally, but spiritually. And I don't know when the Lord's going to come back, but I'm supposed to fight till he does. I'm supposed to be faithful till he does. I'm not fighting for myself. I'm 61. I'm fighting for my kids and my grandkids. I don't want them to be under President Kamala or Speaker of the House AOC. Can you imagine it? Doesn't seem possible. But where we are right now didn't seem possible 10 years ago, did it? Okay, so do we have a mic? How do we want to do this? You want to do it here real quick? You, you tell me before we kind of wrap things up. Are we good? Okay, if you have a question or something that, that you think I could answer, I can't answer all of them, obviously, but if you have a question that you'd like to ask me, anything about Christians engaging, how to make that happen, about running for the legislature, what it was like there, whatever, feel free to ask it here real quick. We have just a little bit of time to do that, and then we're going to kind of wrap it up. I'm going to pray for us, and then Brother Schuyler is going to come and close us out by reminding us what is most important. Anybody have a question? Anything at all? Let's start right there. Okay. The question is, what about the IRS being able to take the non-profit uh, status away from churches if they're a 501c3? That's called the Johnson Amendment. Lyndon B. Johnson was the one who got it placed into the tax law in 1954. It's unconstitutional. In 2008, 33 of us pastors, with the help of a, um, a law group called Alliance Defending Freedom, actually endorsed candidates in our pulpits on a Sunday morning. No, no. We endorsed candidates, and then we sent our messages to the IRS saying, this is what I did yesterday in my church. I just wanted you to know I was expressing my First Amendment right to freedom of speech. Basically, we're wanting to come after us. They did absolutely nothing. We've done it every year since 2008, and the IRS finally admitted they don't have the power to tell preachers what they can and can't preach. Did you know that there has never been a church in the history of the IRS to lose its tax-free status because of political speech? Guys, we have been lied to. Now, the Johnson Amendment's a problem, and we need to get it fixed. When President Trump first became president, he issued an executive order telling the IRS you cannot prosecute churches using the Johnson Amendment. But that did not undo the Johnson Amendment. We need to actually undo it, but it would take Congress to do it. But I tell, look, I've endorsed candidates for my pulpit. I've had candidates that I believed in have speak in my pulpit on Sunday mornings and they have their campaign materials in the back and I told the people, hey, if you live in their district, go vote for them, go get their signs, take them with you and put them in your yards. I mean, are, are we afraid 
of the IRS or are we afraid of standing before God and finding out we were cowards? Brilliant question, but we've been lied to about the Johnson Amendment. It's real. It's like John MacArthur told the governor of California, you arrest me, I'll just start a prison ministry. <laughs> Great question, though. Someone else? Another question? Yeah, right here. We just want everybody to hear the question. What was the reason for most of the resistance you experienced from the Republicans regarding abolitionists, uh, abolitionism? Okay, the, the reason that the Republicans resist the concept of abolition, and by the way, let me define abolition. I've been a pro-lifer since way back in the days of the moral majority in the early 80s. There was a time when to say pro-life meant you wanted to end abortion. But something happened and the pro-life movement was hijacked. And today, pro-life for most politicians means absolutely nothing. Now, personally, they don't like abortion. But they're not going to lift a finger to end it. So here's what most legislators would say to me. We can't do that because the Supreme Court has said it's constitutional. Well, do you realize that the Supreme Court does not make law? They don't have the power to legislate. That's their opinion. Did you know that there have been presidents throughout our history that have ignored the Supreme Court? What do you think would happen if a state wrote into its state constitution that abortion is murder? By the way, did you know our state constitution says that? Our state constitution says abortion is murder unless it's performed by a doctor. That's what it says. What do you think the federal government would do if a state like Oklahoma said, we're not murdering any more babies? Does it matter? I mean, let's be honest. Does it matter? What if they scrambled the bombers? Well, isn't that a cause worth fighting for? I believe it is. Corey Ten Boom thought it was. Oscar Schindler thought it was. That was their reason. They're scared to death of the Supreme Court and they don't want to offend the federal government. But here's the beauty. Right now we have a window. It's called Donald Trump. We have a window of opportunity if we'll take it. And I just couldn't get Oklahoma to do it. But that's their fear. They've been told that the Supreme Court governs our land. Do you honestly believe that the framers would have taken flintlocks like I just held up before you and fought for eight years just so they could allow nine judges to govern us? How stupid is that? We've been lied to, friends. We've been lied to about the Johnson Amendment, although it's real, but it's unconstitutional. We just won't challenge it. We've been lied to about the Supreme Court. Now, I'm not trying to say that we ought to just flip our nose up and just be rebels and do whatever we want to do, but guys... Murdering babies is immoral, it's unconscionable, it's an abomination. If we won't draw the line there, guys, we ain't going to draw the line. Does that help answer that question? Republicans are just afraid. Plus, they're also afraid that it'll hurt their chances of getting a certain committee chairmanship. They don't want to offend the Speaker of the House and the Senate pro tem. They, they want to move forward with their political career. See, I couldn't give a rip about a political career. When I told my friends that I was walking out of the legislature after two terms, they said, well, you at least ought to stay until you're vested in the retirement program. I said, I didn't run here to get a retirement. I came here to fight for what is right. Maybe you guys ought to try that on. It fits quite well. Anybody else before we wrap it up? Reading, yes, sir. Reading that statement right up there. Yeah. Okay, the question is, when or how do we do what Samuel Adams is saying? Well, we've waited so long, we're way behind. Okay, so let's just admit it. We're way behind. Right now, about all we can do is to try to get as many people as we can to vote for Donald Trump on November the 3rd. Again, I don't believe Donald Trump's the Savior, so don't misunderstand me here. But I'm telling you guys... President Kamala Harris or President Joe Biden is disaster for liberty. Listen to what they've said they're going to do. Just listen to what they've said they're going to do. Guys, if they get the power, they'll do it. 
So right now, that's about all we can do. But here's what we can do after that. We can start pressing our own representatives and state senators. Right out there are some tables. And did you know that the, what is, is he the state senator for this area has been asked? Okay, state rep. Would you run a bill that would outlaw abortion? He said, if enough citizens ask me to, yes. Well, that's the wrong answer, to be honest with you. He ought to say, yes. But you ought to go out there if you're in his district, or would be if he gets elected, and, and sign that petition. Let him hear from you. We need, to, we need to get in the faces in a respectful way of these legislators and state senators and the governor. By the way, guys, let me tell you something. I was just as smart before I was elected as I was after I was elected, and I'm not so sure that I didn't get dumber after being elected. We fawn over these elected officials like they're somehow better than us. They're not. I have served with them. You're, most of you in this room are far more informed, know far more about our history than they do. Don't be afraid of them. Be respectful, don't be obnoxious, but don't be afraid of them. Other things we can do is form groups like this that will then go out and vet candidates and get people to run. We gotta get people out there running. I didn't win the governor's race, that's obvious. But by our message, we changed the governor's race. And now all of a sudden, the idea of abolition of abortion is sweeping across Oklahoma like a prairie fire. Well, I call that a win. That's a win. I mean, the results are up to God. All I can be is faithful. We can wake up our preachers. Wake those guys up. And in a respectful kind of way, if they won't wake up, go to a church where the pastor is awake. Where he will actually preach the whole counsel of God and not just the parts that he considers non-controversial. There's a few of us around the state. Support us. Help us. And I don't mean support with money. I mean with your presence. Find a pastor like that. Start a church if you have to. Stop listening to these icicles who stand behind a pulpit who say almost absolutely nothing every Sunday morning except just warmed over John 3.16 messages. We've got to get beyond that. Now, I don't mean beyond Jesus. There's no getting beyond Jesus. He's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. But we've got to start supporting guys that will speak out. Do you know that most pastors won't even have me do the black robe in their church? You know why? Because they're banking on the fact their people don't know about it and they don't have to deal with it. But if they have me in their church, their people become wise to it and they're going to start asking him, why aren't you speaking out? And then they have to quit going to the golf course so often. And they actually have to stand up and grow a backbone and not fall over limp like jello and actually have to form some convictions. I'm telling you this because I'm a pastor and I know lots of them. And most of them have a pretty cushy job, and they don't want to rock the boat and mess it up. George Barna, in 2014, asked pastors, does the Bible speak out against these controversial issues? They all said yes. Then he said, are you going to preach about them? And they said no. So he asked pastors, why not? Do you know the top two reasons that pastors gave for not speaking out on controversial passages of Scripture, as if there is such a thing? The top two reasons, they said it'll hurt our attendance and it'll hurt the size of our offerings. Those are the top two reasons American pastors gave for not engaging. I, I don't mean to sound preachy, forgive me, but this is very near and dear to my heart. I'm very passionate about it. Anybody else before I pray and then I'm going to ask Brother Schuyler to come and kind of wrap it up? Anybody else? Okay, well, here's the deal. Out there on the table... There's a book that I wrote that tells you the story of the Black Robe Regiment. The stories are phenomenal. I don't know about the writing, but the stories are incredible. These, these men and women were just unbelievable, and we haven't been taught them. This is the book that I hope will set the record straight on Romans 13. And then we hired a movie company 
to actually make a documentary of the Black Robe Regiment. We do it in period costume, on location. There's about a seven minute movie that starts it off where you're seated in the church of one of these patriot pastors in the 1770s. It's, it's a really cool presentation. Those are all out there if you're interested. But I'm also gonna be out there with that uh, museum. And for any of you who wanna hear some of the stories and hold those, I want you to join me because I think it's incredible to be able to see those that were there and did it. Okay, I want to pray for us, and then I'm going to invite one of our local pastors to come. But let me pray. Can I do that? Thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you for allowing me to kind of throw this stew at you. I hope it's made some sense. Uh, I hope that we've covered some important things that, that you, you needed or wanted to hear. If I can ever be of any help to you in any way, I would be honored to do so. Father, our liberty is on the edge. Now, thankfully, in you, our liberty is secure. And in the end, Lord, we've led, read the last chapter of the book. We know how it all turns out. Your kingdom wins. Wins. But Lord, until then, we're told to fight the good fight. Lord, we have... We've sat by and we've let this stuff happen and we've let men and women who are in the legislature or in Congress sweet talk us and basically lie to us while we've taken liberties away, we've legislated terrible morality or immorality, we perversions, <laughs> we murder these little preborn babies. We confiscate people's hard-earned labor and, 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 and income through unconstitutional taxation. Lord, we've just sat by for so long. We're so far behind in the game. But Lord, if you are for us, who can be against us? Lord, help us to be faithful. 